So again, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. We we're going to look at developing and managing your brand, particularly for small businesses, uh, which is what we're all here for. Now, our webinar topic is going to be all about branding. Now, you might think that only larger firms have a brand, but let me assure you that every business has a brand and that includes yours. So in this topic, we'll provide a walkthrough of what branding is all about at a very broad level. The idea is to introduce you to the concept and also to provide you with current business thinking on how branding works, its value to your business, and some of the issues around developing and managing your own brand. Now, brands can be worth a lot of money to a business. They can be very good for you when looking for new customers or for retaining existing ones, but they do require good management in order to be effective. So a brand is a word or symbol or combination of both that communicates a single concept about a firm to those who see or hear it. Now, we actually get the word brand from an old Germanic word actually meaning torch. Now, in earlier times, slaves were branded with a hot iron so owners could find them if they escaped. Now, today, ranchers still use them to brand their cattle. Nature conservationists do the same thing to, to tag and uh, to be able to monitor the patterns of, of wildlife. Now, most businesses these days have a logo, a graphic symbol or of the firm, and a way of indicating what they do in business. But that's not all there is to their brand. Even if a business is just a person's name, Sally Case Brown, it's possible for that to become a company's brand name too, even if Sally K. Brown doesn't have a logo. A brand incorporates a number of elements about a company or even an individual that run in the background there that in, are in people's thoughts rather than in the public view. I was once talking with a business manager and I brought up the issue of branding. Their response, yes, we're in the process of getting a brand. We've engaged some designers to develop one for us, they replied. What the business manager didn't understand was that branding is far more than logos and signage. That business already had a brand. Its brand was what the marketplace thought when they heard their name. It may have been, they always seem too busy for me to care, or they never return phone calls, or they never deliver the work on time. Now, those are all brand perceptions. So. Everyone and every business has a brand. Some are meticulously crafted and maintained, while others just kind of happen without any deliberate action being taken. Your brand defines you and your business. It's a, a combination of what you are and how others see you. You've already made an impression on lots of people, such as suppliers, customers, even if you've never advertised or promoted your business, it still exists there. Some brands are so strong that they actually live in our heads. Let's find out what some of them are. Think of the name of a, a cola-based soft drink, now the name of a, a rental car firm. And speaking about cars, how about the make of a car? And next, a popular fast food restaurant. I wonder what the names were that first came to mind when I asked those questions? What have we got perhaps? Perhaps we've got Coke or Hertz or Toyota or McDonald's. Now, maybe it's Pepsi or Avis or Ford or KFC. What first came to mind for you? Even if you don't consume those products, it's really interesting to see how entrenched the top brands become in our thinking. 
And this is the most important thing about a brand. It can be represented by a logo or some other symbol, but it's a lot more than that. Obviously, Coke has a global headlock on the cola market, but even if brands like Toyota, Hertz, and McDonald's aren't the first that appeared on your list, you still know them and have a good idea about what they are. It doesn't have to say Hertz rental cars. You know what Hertz does, and at least some of their products too, and the sort of quality you might expect. It doesn't have to say Apple computers for the same reason. These are the world's 10 most uh, valuable brands according to a global survey done in 2010. A popular brand such as Coke or Microsoft is worth billions. It's a tangible asset and has a financial value that can legitimately be shown on a balance sheet. And the question had to come. So for my fellow accountants, <laughs> and I, can, I know there are a few with us today, I selected uh, this particular survey because the financial aspects of the valuation were measured in terms of economic profit or EVA, economic value added, which I believe personally is a fairer representation of consumer choice than, I guess, market capitalization, which is more a reflection on investors' perception of management. Uh, the numbers here, though, also include other measurements to take into consideration the impact that brand selection has on consumer preference. Now, to put things into perspective, I think it's worth pointing out that Coca-Cola's brand value alone is worth as much as the total of Ford, Sony, American Express, Kodak, Ikea, and Shell combined. And those aren't small brands by any measurement. Some of the better known brands are just so powerful and successful that they're worth an enormous amount of money. More money, in fact, in many cases than all the more tangible assets of the corporation that own them. So it's important to bear in mind how much value and how much investment these firms make on their brands as much as they do on the products and services. And compare that with smaller businesses, how we're all about uh, focusing on our product and focusing on our team members and you know, focusing on our marketing and our sales of the product or service we produce rather than the overall brand of what it is that we represent to the marketplace. The owners of most small brands have an inferiority complex of sorts about taking on the big brands, but why should they? Any coffee shop can survive at McDonald's up the road if it does a better job than McDonald's on everything that it chooses to do. Small brands can be more flexible than one that's locked into a product or delivery system that can't move fast enough. Small brands can be more creative, especially when circumstances around them change. A small brand can get closer to its customers and actually mean a lot more to them than what it is, and on the surface at least, a much better known global brand. So let's take a look at how branding works. Branding at its most effective is very, very simple. So let's begin with a business name. Branding creates trust and an emotional attachment among consumers. Buying br branded products becomes largely an emotional decision rather than a logical one. Market leaders tend to have a strong brand and are seldom priced below average. This supports the notion, of course, that consumers receive more comfort from that emotional decision than they do from a logical decision. And incidentally, that could be a reason why so many business managers are not able to convert as many sales as they should because they're trying to sell on logic. But that's a different topic altogether. Branding helps consumers make purchasing decisions. The actual product features become far less important. A strong brand helps you sell on value rather than price. 
and a strong brand sends a signal that you're confident about your products or just as importantly, you know what your products are and why a prospective customer should favour them. It also says that you're in the market to stay. The concept of branding while retaining its original this is mine hands off warning has achieved its second and uh, crucially value building dimension sending a message to customers, ours is better, you should buy it. Here on the screen now are some examples courtesy of Reader's Digest of well respected brands based on consumers perception on the quality of that brand. So if you can develop or build your brand, you have access to a new weapon in the battle for market share. And certainly when advisors are working with business managers, that's one of the key strategies for success. Your brand will help you combat the attempts of competitors to enter your territory. It will help retain existing customers too by leveraging that loyalty. Having a recognised brand also enables you to avoid discounting and maintain pricing levels when these recognised brands are cutting theirs. So by developing and then using your brand's strength and aggressive marketing moves, you can gain market share from lesser known brands, even if those brands belong to firms that are similar or, in fact, even larger than you. So I hope by now you realise that although you may have thought your firm perhaps didn't have a brand that needs managing, the chances are pretty good that it does. So if your customers have already given you a brand, I guess it's really up to you to do something with it. You most certainly need to manage it. Branding is the execution of consistently presenting the personality of your business. It consists of your business name, your logo, your communications, and the perception of your brand. The ownership of a brand is generally protected by law. It's seen as a unique property and cannot be used by others without the owner's permission. It's really important to see your brand as a significant business asset of yours that translates into valuable goodwill when the business is sold. The investment you make in branding your firm will be reflected in the sale price years from now, I absolutely guarantee. If a brand is simply your own name, it's also yours to use without any other legalities. Sally K. Brown can use her own name as a brand even if it's shared with the world's largest corporation. This has been done by people with names like Ford or Ferrari, by the way. If you make up a word like uh, Xerox or Kodak, it can take a lot of time and financial support before it starts representing something in the minds of consumers. And that tends to be out of the reach of smaller businesses. If you want to use a real word like Sun or Jaguar, you may well find that somebody else has had the same idea and protected it and are willing to uh, defend that right. The more you look around at the world's great brands, the more evident it becomes that the only rule about branding is that there are no rules and often not much rhyme nor reason either. Certainly the choice of a preferred name is a strategic decision that should only be made after all the ramifications are taken into consideration. I think it would be fair to say that the name should reflect your target market, your own identity, and be something that strikes a chord with your targeted customer base. Your brand is a vital part of your overall marketing efforts. It should tell people what you do and not be easily confused with another company. But don't be too limiting when choosing a brand name. Businesses often expand into new market areas and 
your name should be capable of expanding with it. Limiting a brand name by product sounds reasonable, but may be short-sighted. The Diners Club name became more and more restrictive as credit cards replaced cash for the widest imaginable spectrum of purchases beyond entertaining. Now, Diners Club was the first credit card, so they had what should have been a useful head start over American Express. Remember too to make your name memorable. This doesn't mean being funny or necessarily gimmicky, but it's got to live in people's minds and not be easily forgotten. Your brand name should be consistent with your positioning. If you're a high quality brand, your name must reflect that quality and we'll talk about positioning in just a moment. Your brand should incorporate as strongly as possible who you are, what you do well, and what your customers actually want of you. If your target market hears your company's name and immediately know these things about your business, then you've got a brand and it's performing well. Think of the brands of global marketers, Ford and Sony and Apple and Microsoft. The name is far more important than just a logo. These are perceptions of size, of technological superiority, of product values, and manufacturing standards. Those perceptions have been built up over periods of many years, carefully created by advertising and PR campaigns, and that's really how branding works. How does it all this apply to the brand of a smaller business? All brands that are now recognized around the world started off as unknowns and grew to where they are today. Start with your business name. Give it a careful examination. Is it easily read, easy to spell, easy to look up in the phone book or even over the internet? Is it easily pronounced? Does it have any negative connotations? Is it too restrictive? Does it represent where you want to be? When you're trying to decide on a name for your business, just remember that it might make sense to you but could be misunderstood by others. Also be careful of being just too gimmicky or clever. That part of your brand is always going to be associated with your business and must be carried with it as your business grows. Now I mentioned just before about positioning. It's a critically important element of branding. Now there are four broad categories of positioning that are based on the relationship of product quality and price and almost every brand will fit somewhere into one of these categories, some more neatly than others. Where do you want to position your brand? Are you a combination of high quality and uh, high price? If so, you're a premium brand and you need to promote the quality and prestige of your offerings. If on the other hand you're a low quality, but high price brand, then you'll need a lot of sales pressure in order to turn over or sell your products. A low quality, low price positioning is used for generic products that completely uh, compete just solely on price, in which case you'll need a, a clear cost leadership advantage where you can source key components of your product or service at a price and a quality that your competitors just can't match. That ensures you can preserve enough margin to trade profitably. A high quality product at a low price represents a genuine bargain to customers. It may not be sustainable, meaning the business may well go out of business as quality costs. Decide where you want to position your brand and be consistent with that positioning in all of your marketing. 
build the brand's character by reflecting that positioning in absolutely everything that your company does. It really is important though that you're very, very comfortable on where you want to be with regard to this sort of matrix that's on the screen. Today's consumers faced with such an overwhelming, unrelenting barrage of brands and other messages that most simply disappear in the crush. To get the absolute utmost out of your brand, you should expose it consistently at every single opportunity. Once the company has an attractive representation of its name, it's time to put it on everything in the business. Every item of stationery, the sign at the front of your building, your website, any advertising or promotional work, even those Christmas cards. Extend this to include the way your telephone is answered. Put the whole brand into it. Good morning, Sally K. Brown is how the meeting should go in Sally's case. If it's your brand, be proud of it. If it sounds a bit wishy-washy, then perhaps that's a good indication of what the marketplace might be thinking of it as well. Your brand needs to be marketed within the business so every member of your team has a clear concept of what its positioning is and, really importantly, what it means to the customers. This understanding of the brand will be translated into the way customer relationships are managed, into the design of product packaging, into the tone and content of your advertising and into every other aspect of your business that's administered by your team. Invite team members to offer any suggestions about their company's branding they might have. There could be many branding opportunities, perhaps on uniforms, equipment, or other less obvious places that they'll spot even if you haven't. By involving them in the management of the brand, you also give them a chance to share the pride of ownership that you currently feel. The name should be used in the same way wherever it appears. So it's really important to establish guidelines for all possible uses that describe in detail exactly how it's to be used, including color, um, size, font, relative to other elements. To be effective as a brand, the name's usage must be as consistent as it is well presented. The image qualities and promises projected by your brand should also be reflected in every aspect of your business performance, from the satisfaction your products or services deliver, to the manner in which your phones are answered and your reception area looks, and the way you deal with queries or problems. Naturally, it also includes the way your emails are written too. However it's projected, a name, a logo, or both, your branding is one of the most important ways your business interacts with the world. While consistency is the key to branding, that's not to say you can never change at all. Brands often find it necessary or even desirable to reinvent themselves in response to changing times and markets. The owners of some brands that want to keep them looking up to date but are afraid of making radical or revolutionary changes go through a process of slow and gradual evolution. Others prefer a dramatic change from old to new that make it as quickly as possible with a lot of fanfare. It depends on your overall marketing strategy. Consistency is one of the keystones of successful branding and change is something you should never undertake lightly or without careful consideration of the costs and benefits involved. And next, we'll look at some terminology you're likely to come across when the subject of branding is being discussed 
and that is brand extensions and brand stretching. The term brand extension is given to the use of a successful brand name to launch a new product into the same general market as an established product. The use of a well-known brand makes it much easier for a business to enter a new product category. Spending on a new entrant can also reinforce the brand's strength of the original product too. Now, there should be a link between the two products. They don't necessarily have to be as closely linked as the example on the screen, but there does need to be a link between the products if they share the same brand. For example, both can be in the broad category of, say, uh, kitchen products, or both can be legal services, but sold to different uh, demographic targets. Brand stretching, on the other hand, is a term applied to using an established brand name for products sold in unrelated markets. This leads to the original brand becoming an umbrella over multiple product groups. And this can have several advantages. A familiar brand name is more acceptable to resellers. A familiar brand name is more acceptable too to consumers. The good attributes of the brand are seen to carry over to the new product. The new product can be incorporated into the umbrella brand's advertising. There is a drawback, of course, if the new product flops or is seen to be just too far apart from the original brand, it can actually weaken the strength of the successful branding. You know, one of the earliest and, <clears throat> may I say it, sneakiest examples of brand stretching or indirect advertising, as it's sometimes called, was uh, in Norway, where following a ban on tobacco advertising in the mid-70s, advertisements for camel boots started to appear in magazines and newspapers. Now, the ads were identical to those that had previously been advertised camel cigarettes in absolutely just about every, every single way. And let me assure you, it was very, very difficult to find a pair of camel boots. The government of the day moved very swiftly to uh, plug that anomaly in the legislation. But it just kind of shows you about how effective brand extensions can, uh, can be. So what does your brand really mean? Do some research. Find out just what your brand really is. It would be best to have an outside party. Conduct the research to make sure you're getting honest, objective responses. It doesn't necessarily mean engaging an expensive market research firm, though. Just find someone who has that ability to be able to talk to people, ask questions, and accurately record their answers. And your RAN1 advisor actually has a very good tool to be able to uh, work with your customers to find the answers. Next, you need to work out just what it is you're asking questions about. If your business has a logo of any sort, even if it's only on your firm's letterhead, it needs to be researched. Your business name and the names of the principals should also be examined. Who do you think already knows you and has formed an opinion of your brand? Your clients and suppliers are, are really good places to start, you know. Include your team members and a sample of your competitors as well. Remember, don't be too precious. This is all about doing the right thing by your business. And sometimes if the business has become our baby, and quite often that's the case, we uh, uh, might take offense to some of the comments that come back. Uh, putting our head in the sand is not the way to run a successful business, and this could be the opportunity. And one of the things that can really contribute to helping you achieve those goals that may have become somewhat fuzzy over the last few years. A way of measuring a company's return on its investment and branding is to apply a process that we refer to as brand metrics. Now, this is very much in line, of course, with what we're always saying in our webinars, what you can measure, you can manage. You need to establish 
categories of measurement for your brand that will give you your feedback on its performance. Now, some of the categories you can measure are how well is the brand organized, uh, recognized? How highly is it thought of? How does it rate against competing brands? How well do you use it? And how well do you manage it? Measuring brand performance should be done in the same way you measure the performance of other assets. You're looking for proof of an ROI, that's return on investment. Too often the only measurement systems applied to brands are inherent to the brand itself. Instead, the performance of the brand should be related to the investment made in it. Devise a simple system for your brand that is linked to the brand building your company does. Repeatedly use the same system of brand management to create a history that's linked to the overall performance of your business. Relate it to what's really important to your company, whether it's unit sales, profitability, or revenue growth. It's a very important part, and we've spoken in previous times about the need to treat all of our marketing, all of our advertising the same way. They're all investments, and like any investment, we really have a reasonable expectation that it, we will get a very good return on that investment, and the only way we can measure that is to ensure that we're capturing the right numbers so that we can ensure that we are investing our very scarce resources in the right areas. Marketing, sales, branding, all the same sort of thing. Your brand is the personal link between you and the outside world. It's the sum total of your customer service, your premises, your communications, and every other aspect of your business and your team. Branding is the consistent presentation of a business's unique personality. It's literally the face your business presents to the world. It's a name, how that name is visually expressed through a logo, how that name and logo are extended throughout all of the business's communications, and what people think about when they see or hear it. And when I'm talking about businesses communications, it's also in the way that we talk, in the way that we write, all forms of communication with regard, uh, with relation to the marketplace. It's the one thing that a business owns that nobody can copy or take away from it. But once you have your brand where you want it, you still have to work to keep it there. And it will go nowhere on its own. If you don't take control, then your customers, team members, even your competitors will do that for you. At least one senior member of your team should serve as the brand monitor to make sure that everything that carries your brand, whether it's a website, an email template, a work proposal or engagement letter, or a business card is consistent with the brand dimensions that you're, you want. These are the basics of branding. Most businesses have a brand that starts small, then grows, and needs to be managed. Use your brand and its value will increase. Use it everywhere you can and be as consistent as possible. And before we close, let's clarify that branding isn't everything. Great branding isn't a sure path to success or even survival, any more than mediocre or even poor branding means certain failure. We've all seen great brands die as a result of inadequate planning, poor business decisions, financial mismanagement, or simply through senior management taking their eye off the ball. Start by finding out the dimensions of your brand and then go to work on it. Now, you can begin right now by completing the questionnaire that 
your RAN1 advisor will be sending you to see how your brand scores. And look out for that branding score sheet that um, you'll be receiving for attending this live webinar because it really is a very good place to start and a good way to start implementing the things that we've talked about here. We certainly do think it's a good exercise to get you thinking about your own business branding and just how much you can do with it. So watch your inbox for that to arrive. It's a generic form of brand metrics that will give you an indication about your brand's strengths and weaknesses as they stand today. It can be used as an ongoing tool to monitor performance as well. Even better is if you prepare a customized version of that questionnaire for your company that takes into account your own marketing activities and any research that you do. So watch out for it when it uh, appears in your um, email. And also have a look at the action plan itself, which is all about helping you to implement the ideas that we have been talking about in today's webinar. Fill in the gaps too. Make sure that you've allocated a person to champion each task. We find that means there's more chance of it being implemented. And if it's implemented, and then there's a really good chance of you benefiting from the results. That's the webinar for today. Thank you so much for coming. Branding is a very, very important part of successfully growing and developing your business. There are plenty of opportunities there for you.